In game 10, Botvinnik missed the opportunity to win four times. Two times in the middle game, he played too cautiously while the active play was required, and two times in the end game, as he didn't notice the possibility of Zugzwang. Branstein started with d4, and Botvinnik one more time played the Dutch defense, c4, f5. Knight c3, bishop b4, immediately pinning the knight. So this is a kind of combination of the Dutch defense and Nimtso Indian defense. Queen c2, knight f6, e3, castle kingside, bishop d3. Branstein wants to develop the knight on e2, so that after the exchange on c3, e2 knight replaces c3 knight. But before playing knight e2, he develops the bishop, so that the knight doesn't block the bishop's way. d6, and now that the bishop is developed, knight e2. c5, attacking the center, a3, and now Branstein gets the advantage of two bishops. Bishop takes c3, knight takes c3. Knight c6, attacking the pawn on d4. d takes c, d takes c, b3. Branstein wants to fianchetto the bishop, and on b2 the bishop would exert very strong pressure on black's position and would be placed very well, as black doesn't have the dark squared bishop anymore to oppose the bishop on b2, and also black has weakened his kingside by playing f5. So all this will make the bishop on b2 very strong. Bishop d7, bishop b2, knight e5, attacking the bishop on d3. And here Branstein made his first inaccuracy. He decided to retain the bishop pair and played bishop e2. However, both players in their annotations to this game agree that it would have been much stronger to castle queenside, ensuring the king's safety and uh, letting black capture on d3. And if black captured on d3, after rook takes d3, it's true, white doesn't have bishop pair anymore, but instead white has um, positional advantage as, black, uh, as white would dominate on the only open d file. And both rooks on d1 and d3 would exert very strong pressure on d file, as currently both black queen and black bishop are placed on the d file. And combined with a very strong bishop on b2, the rooks would ensure a positional advantage for white. Instead of this, Branstein decided to retain the bishop pair and played bishop e2. Bishop c6, attacking g2. And here Branstein makes a more serious mistake. He plays, he plays f3. However, this move seriously weakens the king side. Instead of f3, it would have been better to play knight d5, putting the knight right under attack, but opening the bishop's diagonal, which would attack the unguarded knight on e5. And if e takes d, then just bishop takes e5. And for example, after knight g4, attacking the bishop, Bishop takes g4, f takes g, the position would have been equal. But after f3, Botvinnik seizes the initiative by playing knight h5, creating immediate threat. Queen h4 check, and white won't be able to play g3 in this case, because knight would capture on g3, as the pawn on h2 is pinned. After h takes g, the rook would fall. In order to prevent all this, Branstein plays knight d1. Now, after queen h4 check, knight f2 would follow. However, knight d1 proves to be a mistake, a serious mistake. Instead of this, it would have been better in order to prevent this uh, queen h4 check, just castle king set. And if queen g5, attacking the pawn on e3 and exerting pressure on the king set, then again the same move, knight d5, would have uh, given white equal position. Knight on d5 is defending e3, and the knight is under attack. And if e takes d, then f4 with a fork attacking the queen would follow. And after queen retreats, bishop takes e5 and white would be even slightly better. Instead of castling kingside, however, Branstein plays knight d1 as he has a very interesting but incorrect idea in his mind. He didn't want to castle kingside because he wanted to make black help him open the g file. And he wanted to place his rook on g1, and after the g-file is open, the rook, combined with the bishop, would exert very strong pressure on g7. So he believed in the power of bishop and rook combination. However, uh, the g-file would open later in the game, as you will see, but uh, his um, dream uh, didn't fulfill. Uh, and nothing happened on g7, and uh, all this idea proved to be 
wrong and unjustified. Knight g6, queen c3, creating queen and bishop battery and attacking g7, however, the knight is defending it. Queen g5, attacking g2, g3, e5, knight f2. Now, after knight uh, moved from d1, white needs just one move to castle queenside and solve all problems. But, of course, Batvinik didn't let white do it and played rook d8, preventing long castle. And here Branstein makes the most serious mistake in this game. Uh, he, he, instead of playing rook d1, which would partially solve his problems, played rook g1, sticking to his initial plan. And now, uh, by playing f4, uh, Batvinik could have won the game on the spot, but he didn't play it. If black played f4, uh, Batvinik uh, and Branstein both give different variations. Batvinik gives the following variation. Knight h3, uh, attacking the queen. After queen moves, g takes f. Of course, immediately g takes f didn't uh, work because the rook would fall. So, g takes f. Now, Branstein would uh, have got what he dreamt of. But, after knight takes f4, knight takes f4, e takes f, e4, bishop takes f4, f takes e, f3, Bishop takes f3, rook takes f3, queen takes f3, queen d2 check, and queen takes b2. Black would win, as both the rook is attacked, and a deadly, terrible rook f8 with a pin is threatened. So black would win. This is Batvinik's variation. Branstein gives his own variation, h4. So again, uh, g takes f immediately is impossible because the rook would fall. That's why first the queen must be distracted from the g file. So h4. Queen e7. Now g takes f. But again, white uh, doesn't have anything because the knight is blocking the g file and uh, white doesn't have uh, any attack. e takes f. e4. Knight takes h4. Knight d3. Knight g3. Again, g file is blocked. And if knight takes f4, then just rook takes f4. Rook takes g3, currently uh, very serious threat, checkmate actually is threatened on uh, g7, but rook d4, blocking both the bishop and the queen, and creating a terrible, deadly threat on e4. After fall of e4 pawn, the white position would fall. If queen e3, then the knight sacrifice, weakening e4 pawn, and after bishop takes f3, rook sacrifice, and the queen is pinned, the queen is lost, and uh, black is winning. So, after rook g1, by playing f4, both players agree in their annotations that uh, black would win on the spot. But Batvinik avoided the sharp tactical battle and wanted to win just positionally, by maneuvering instead, and played queen e7, after which he lost the most part of his advantage. Because now Branstein manages to escape his king. He played rook d1, knight f6, rook d2, and now through d1 the king escapes to the queen side. a6. Now Batvinik starts the expansion on the queen side. King d1, b5, king c1, b4. So, uh, squeezing and smothering white pieces even more and getting space advantage on the queen side too. Queen c2, rook takes d2, queen takes d2, rook d8, queen c2, and now f4. Uh, it's also strong, not as strong as uh, on move 19, of course, because on move 19, f4 would have led to a deadly attack on the king. But now this move has a different purpose. After f4, e3 pawn would inevitably disappear. Either uh, white would capture on f4 or black would capture on e3. And e3 pawn is very important. It plays a very important role as it defends d4 square. 
and after its disappearance, d4 would be terribly weakened, and black knight would be placed ideally on d4. It would dominate on d4, and white would be forced to exchange his most powerful piece, the bishop, on d4. And after this, the rook would capture, and the second uh, knight would be rerouted to d4, and black would have a uh, strategically winning position. So that's why uh, Batvinik avoided all these uh, tactical battles. He just wanted to win positionally without any risk whatsoever. But, as you will see, it didn't work. G takes f, e takes f, as e3 is under attack, so e4. Now, a5, knight d3, and here uh, Batvinik had his second chance of winning on the spot, again by tactics, by sacrificing on e4, so by capturing on e4, f takes e, bishop takes e4, with a dead, terrible, un unpleasant pin, the knight is attacked twice, and is pinned. And if rook d1, for example, defending the knight, then f3, attacking the bishop, and knight f4, attacking the knight the third time. So white is just paralyzed, and it's impossible to defend d3. Or if instead of uh, rook d1, if queen d2, moving away from one pin, but now the knight is still pinned, now the rook is pinning it, then just b takes a, Bishop takes a3, now the bishop moved away from this diagonal, and e5 square is free for the knight. After f3, bishop f1, knight e5, again attacking the knight third time, and the defense is impossible. So, again, by playing sharply, by capturing on e4, but Vinik could have won on the spot. But, again, he decides to play positionally and maneuver his pieces just to win without any risk. Knight d7. The idea is to reroute the knight through f8 to e6 and d4. But again he lost most part of his advantage. a takes b, a takes b, bishop a1, vacating b2 square for the queen in order to create a bishop and queen battery exerting serious pressure on g7. Knight f8, Rook d1, knight e6, so as uh, the knight was blocking the g file, the rook wasn't doing anything on g1, so Bernstein uh, finally decided to accept the fact that his plan was wrong and the rook wasn't doing anything on g1, and he just uh, started to defend his position. Knight e5, this leads to the exchange, mass exchanges, Knight takes e5, bishop takes e5, queen g5, rook takes d8, queen takes d8, queen d2, exchange of queens, and we have the end game now. White's main problem is a bad bishop, light squared bishop, as all uh, white pawns are on light squares. And white is going to reroute this bishop through f1 to h3 and activate this bishop on this diagonal. That's why, in order to prevent this, Batvinik plays g5. The idea is to play h5 and g4, and after th that the bishop won't be able to uh, get activated. King d3, king f7, bishop f1, h5, and here Branstein didn't play bishop h3, which he had to play. Probably he was scared of playing it because of g4. And if f takes g, then of course black doesn't capture immediately because the bishop would capture back. But black has the move knight g5. Probably this is what Brunstein was scared of, attacking the bishop. Bishop has to retreat. And now, as the knight on g5 also attacks e4, bishop takes e4, check. Capturing the pawn with check. And after king retreats, h takes g. However, bishop takes f4, attacking the knight, knight e6, bishop d6, bishop c2, this is also looks very dangerous, attacking the pawn, but bishop g2 was possible, 
and after bishop takes b3, bishop d5, defending c4 pawn, pinning the knight, which is defending c5, so c5 would also fall, and this position would be equal. But it wasn't so easy to foresee all this variation, and uh, Branstein played bishop e2, after which black has the advantage. King e7, bishop f1, bishop d7, and now bishop h3. However, after knight d8, bishops are exchanged, and now black, is, black has absolutely winning endgame. <clears throat> king e7, bishop g7, king f7, bishop e5, and you might be surprised why this uh, endgame is absolutely winning, but Winnick didn't find a winning move in this position. He played king e7, but instead of this, king g6 was winning, because black would prepare g4, after which the king would move to g5, would be very active, and black would have passed uh, pawn. Of course, not immediately, because currently the bishop is defending, uh, is attacking the pawn on f4, and if uh, g pawn moves, the f4 would fall. However, after king g6, white would be in Zugzwang. The bishop must stay on this diagonal, because if it moves from this diagonal, f4 pawn would be uh, safe, for example, if bishop moves to a1, then g4 immediately would follow. And after f takes g, h takes g, h takes g, king g5, bishop b2, king takes g4, the pawn is passed, this pawn on e4 isn't dangerous because the knight is stopping it, and b3 would also fall because uh, the king can always uh, move to uh, b3 and capture it, and then c c4 would also fall. So this position would be absolutely winning for black. So the bishop must stay on this diagonal. If bishop d6, for example, attacking the pawn, then just knight e6, defending c5, also defending f4, and g4 would follow anyways the same as in the previous variation. If the king moves after king g6, then, for example, if king e2, then knight c6, attacking the bishop and threatening knight a5, after which uh, inevitably b3 would fall. If king d2, then again knight c6, and after the bishop moves, knight d4, attacking both pawns, and uh, after and after knight takes c5, knight, bishop takes c5 is even impossible because of the fork. So, in all variations, after king g6, black is winning, because white is in Zugzwang. White just, any move leads to the worsening of white's position. But, but Winnick didn't find this, and played king e7. Bishop g7, now again he had his last chance to play king f7, and again king g6 with the same position, but for the fourth time in this game, uh, he misses the victory and plays terrible knight b7, after which the position is absolutely equal, because the knight is placed very bad on b7, and Branstein finds the draw. Bishop h6 attacking g5, now the king must defend g5, but now bishop f8 attacking c5. The knight cannot move because c5 would fall. So king must move, but now again bishop h6 attacking g5. King again must return to the defense. Now again bishop f8. The knight cannot move. King f6, king e2. Now king moves. King f7, bishop h6 again, bishop f8 again, and here they agreed to a draw. Hit the like button as it contributes to the uh, channel growth and see you in the analysis of game 11.